Hi, and welcome to Ask a Naturalist Winter in Vermont. We're so excited to answer your questions about the natural world during winter time. There are three organizations represented tonight. Audubon Vermont, the Birds of Vermont Museum, and the Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas, aka the Herp Atlas. And from those organizations, we have Aaron Talmadge, who is the executive director of the Birds of Vermont Museum, and is also wearing her hat as assistant herpetologist at the Vermont Herp Atlas. We have Allison Gurgley, who is the museum educator at the Birds of Vermont Museum. And from Audubon, Vermont, we have Ray Bronnenkant, our youth leadership coordinator, and myself, Sarah Hugis. I am Audubon, Vermont's Education and Outreach AmeriCorps member. And with that, why don't we start diving into some questions? Thanks so much for being here. Um, another question that we got in advance was about trees. The question is, what is the benefit for some trees like beeches and oaks to hold on to their leaves through the winter? Uh, beech trees, I remember looking up because I've always been very curious about that. Um, I really love looking at the, the light brown leaves all kind of crispy and crinkly blowing in the winter breezes. I honestly can't recall there being a definitive um, decision on what the point of that is, um, why they keep those leaves. Um, but there are a lot of beech trees that um, do seem to keep their leaves. I've checked in several different um, volumes of nature information and it's more of a, a statement that yes, these trees tend to keep their leaves, but there wasn't uh, really any specific answer. And I'm hoping someone else either on the panel or in the um, audience can help us out with that. What have you learned and seen? I know I don't want to put her on the spot because she just joined. Um, Ray Bronicant is our other naturalist on the call. She works with me over at Audubon, Vermont. She's our youth coordinator, youth leadership coordinator. And we were just talking about beech leaves clinging on to the ends of their stems. And yeah, so sorry that I'm quite the adventurous day everybody it's so <laughs> see all the people that are here um so my there's a few reasons why beech leaves keep their le keep beech trees keep their leaves um and a couple of those reasons are one is that some people think maybe they were sort of in the mix of um between coniferous and deciduous um so they were somewhere on like the timeline trying to um, evolve between those um, like two different adaptations. And then the other piece is that it gives them um, an advantage in the spring when everything's starting to leaf out, they already have leaves so that, um, so that they um, are like, you know, covering some sun from the smaller, smaller trees around as well as they drop the leaves for nutrition. That was, those are the reasons that I know of. <laughs> those are awesome. I also heard that it tends to be the younger beech trees. I, I don't know if that's true, but I'm going to go out in the woods and certainly look for that if it's mostly just the younger ones that have the leaves or if the older ones do too. Yeah. I certainly have noticed the low ones to the ground have more, more of their leaves, which would make sense if they're trying to sh crowd out the smaller trees as well um, in the springtime. So that would make sense. I, I love the idea that they keep them for their own um, nutrients. So the leaves fall in the spring and that's their fertilizer. Totally. It's like a superpower. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Ray. Yeah. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to add or should we jump into another question? Great. Moving on to another question. Um, we had a question about what Arctic bird species we might see in Vermont this winter. Well, hello, there's me. <laughs> Chances are good, from what I hear, um, that snowy owls are back in the area. So keep an eye out for those. Um, certainly out near the, the Champlain Basin um, pasture land areas where it mimics the tundra where these birds um, breed and Typically, typically live. Um, I have not seen any yet, but I haven't been out checking. But I'm hearing they're out there. There is one, I think I mentioned this last call, but since I mentioned it last, somebody has confirmed they saw the owl at um, Rice Lumber in Shelburne, Vermont. There is a snowy owl residing somewhere over there. So if you go around dusk, maybe you'll 
There is there is quite a lot in the bird in the bird world right now about some of the birds that um, people are looking at that if we don't want to disturb them, and and we don't want to be on property that isn't really set up for lots of birders to come. So if you do know of any birds or owls or any any bird um, that might be sensitive to you coming up, we just really want to push to be very respectful of the property owner, whoever happens to be whoever happens to own the property the bird is on, and also of the bird. So we really don't want to stress any bird out. I mean, this is winter, they're trying to survive. They need to eat, they need to be safe. And um, we just don't want to go out there and scare them away. And so I know probably a number of you are on Vermont Bird, the listserv, and there's a lot of information right now about kind of how to be a respectful bird watcher. But in terms of Arctic birds, every fall um, comes out the winter finch forecast. And that's, that's kind of exciting if you like Arctic birds and you like birding in the winter. And it comes out in the fall and you can Google that and you can read and it predicts what Arctic birds or what boreal forest birds are gonna come down to Vermont during the winter. And it's really based on their food supplies, both if they don't have that much food that are likely to move come down to Vermont, or if they have a really good year and they have lots of young, the young might come down to Vermont, which is I think, typically the case with a snowy owl. And so looking at that winter finch forecast, it was predicted to be a good year, as Allison said, for snowy owls, but also for things like evening growth speak, pine growth speak, pine system. Um, and so far it has been a good year. And um, there's some really if you like winter birds, there's some really fun ones, especially the pine grosbeak, which doesn't come here maybe every, I'm not sure, every eight to 10 years. So it's a good year to go look for pine grosbeak. And jumping onto that just a little bit, Erin, is um, something I happened to come across that um, if those uh, conifer seed um, food sources are, are what are compelling the smaller birds, the songbirds to come, that also suggests that a lot of the rodents are um, suffering a little bit too. So there will be a smaller population of rodents, but that would suggest maybe um, the northern hawk owl and the great gray might be coming this way too, looking for food. Great, and Al's, or actually Erin, you had mentioned a term boreal forest, and I was just hoping if you could clarify what that means for folks. Um, <laughs> it's the it's the forest um, north of us. So sort of like the boreal forest would be. There's a little bit in Vermont, um, and it's based on the habit, based on the kinds of trees that are found in the forest. And there are a lot of bird, a lot of birds that migrate through Vermont actually nest in the boreal forest. It's also called the northern forest. I don't know. Somebody else might want to. Anybody know sort of the specific species of forests that you might find of trees? Yeah, my understanding is it's it really is above Hudson Bay and it, it stands about 600 miles wide um, south to north. Um, our uh, ruby crowned kinglet and golden crowned kinglet um, don't live in the boreal forest, they go even farther north, but they're an amazing little species of bird in their own right, but they are um, birds that come back and have to fly all the way across that boreal forest just to get back to their wintering grounds. Great, yeah, I bet you would anticipate lots of evergreens and species that have adapted to very cold conditions in a boreal forest like the ones that we just talked about. Great, thank you. Um, any questions in the chat, Erin, or should I jump to our, our list here? I would, um, there aren't any in the chat yet, but it kind of, I know one of the questions and it, it kind of ties in with what kind of hawks you might see in Vermont hmm. in the winter. And there are a few hawks, like the rough-legged hawk that we were, Sarah and I were talking about earlier that comes down to Vermont in the winter. So it breeds north of us, but it will come down and it, it um, this is part of its normal winter range. And then a number of our hawks are here all year, such as the red-tailed hawk and the cooper's hawk and the sharp-chinned hawk. And then we do have a few hawks that, that migrate and we don't see them this time of year. So, but the nice thing about winter is you can actually see them because there's no leaves on the trees. So you can see them perching either in the sidewalk, not in the sidewalk, along the road as you're driving. 
or in some of the fields. And um, we do have a we do have a migration map, which I don't know if we can. Do you want to share the screen and show people the map of the rough-legged hawk? Uh, it's migration. I can I can Google and share. I have the PowerPoint pulled up, but um, unless someone has it. Yeah, the, a link is in the chat right at the beginning. Oh, well, I don't have that, so I can't do oh. that. <laughs> I do, here. <laughs> All right, so. So the, the site that she's showing is, is through eBird and it's through their science site. And you can, you can type in all different types of species and you can actually show it's based on eBird sightings that people have contributed and it will show the migration pattern of a bird. So this is the rough-legged hawk. And as somebody had asked is what hawks are here in the winter and you can see it goes really far north in the summer. And then it comes down here in Vermont, you know, just sort of touches along the Champlain Valley in Vermont. And then as soon as it starts to get warm again, it goes pretty far north. I love this map. <laughs> And this website is, is just a great resource for any species you're kind of interested in because it does show you where that where the bird is all year round. I'll stop sharing the screen now. Great. Thanks, Erin. Um, I know that we had some questions about what animals do during the winter. Um, if you have any specific animals that you would like to know about, just drop them in the chat and we'll talk specifics because Lots of animals do different things throughout the winter. Some of them leave, some of them stay, some of them sleep. So if you're curious about something in particular, just let us know. Um, otherwise I'll jump to another question in the meantime. And I will share my screen and I can show um, the, some pictures of birds that we've seen so far too, which would be kind of fun. Great, that would be awesome, Ray. I know that we have a photo of a red-tailed hawk in that one. Um, yeah, so, oops, did that work? So it's it's open, but um, so on the left is that um, pine grosbeak bird, and then the right is that red pole, so they were talking about finches. And I noticed at my house, I live in Huntington, there are like 30 red poles that live in the um, birch trees right now that are just, actively eating all the seeds um, and spreading the seeds, which is pretty exciting to watch. And they all like flit in together. It's such a small bird, but when you get up close, they're totally beautiful. But that pine grosbeak, like um, Aaron was saying, you should definitely go take a look. And it definitely is a really good year for finches. Um, yeah, and then there's a photo of the hawk, which is pretty cool. So I'm just going to jump in real quick about the pine growth peak. They, they tend to be on fruit trees and especially like flowering crab apples. And people, they, they are, like I saw them in downtown Bristol. I, mean, I don't know if we can say Bristol as a downtown, but we saw them in downtown Bristol. And I know people have seen them on some of those planted fruit trees in front of, in front of big buildings at, and at college campuses. So it's not one that you have to, you know, hike up Mount Abe to see. And the picture there is the male and it's pink like that. And the female has the same shape, but it's more of a yellow olive. And once you see one, keep looking because they're usually in flocks of a few of them. Yeah, I'll share. This is kind of a great photo right here. It's sharing off Google, but. <laughs> yeah, and this is them in the <laughs> fruit trees. Yeah, I feel like their faces are always covered with fruit. Yeah. <laughs> but they're really beautiful. Very cool. Let's see if anybody posted in the chat. Has anybody, I guess, post in the chat if you've seen them and where you've seen them, because that, um, that's the kind of information that we can share. And as I said, I saw them on it in Bristol. And when Luann, Luann posted in the chat back to the beech trees, um, I'm just going to read it. She said the word is marcescence is the term applied to beech and oak trees leaves holding on to the branch. The, those trees have veins which close off the flow of sap and water 
and form an ascension layer of cells, usually young trees. So the ascension is when, if, if in, in the fall, most leaves, like maples, most trees, most deciduous trees, like maples, they form a little corky layer between the twig and the leaf. And that keeps fluid, the sugars and the waters from going through and the leaf basically dies and the chlorophyll breaks down and you see the color and then the leaf falls off. And so what, what um, Luann has posted is this other word, marcescence, is when that break isn't complete. So just to go back to that. Um, and then also back to the pine growth speaks, um, Beth Hunton said she's seen pine growth speaks near her and she's also seen red and white wing crossbills, which I don't know. Oh, if you have, cool. I don't know if you have a picture of that. They're another bird that um, they actually can breed in Vermont, but usually you see more of them in the winter. I'll pull one up. Oh, great. So they're cool because their beak is so awesome. Try to get a good photo. It literally crosses. So they can pry apart um, seeds like pine cones and get into the seeds, which is really, really cool. And they're really similar looking to the um, gross beaks minus that bill. Yeah, they're the same colors. Yeah. The wing bars too help you figure out the identification. I wonder if they have a picture of them eating. Doesn't look like it. <laughs> Great. Thanks for pulling that up, Ray. Yeah. I got excited because we got a question about beavers. So this is switching gears a little bit to some mammals instead of birds, but I love beavers. And the question was, do beavers share their under ice living quarters with others? And how do beavers and otters get along with each other? Um, so yes, beavers do share their under ice living quarters with others. Beavers actually live in family units called colonies. And there are usually like two to eight beavers in a colony, but usually um, closer to like five or six is on average. Um, and that's the adult pair and their offspring, their kits is what they're called, and maybe the previous year's offspring, which are yearlings, um, and occasionally maybe some older offspring too. And they're very territorial animals. They will actively defend the colony's territory, except they do seem to have a soft spot for otters. So my, I wish she was my friend, but she's just an idol. Mary Holland from Naturally Curious wrote a really cool piece about how otters and beavers seem to have um, a commensal relationship, which means one animal benefits while the other is unaffected. Um, so the beaver is unaffected because it's an herbivore. It eats bark and um, leafy and woody things. And so its food supply is not threatened by the otter that eats fish and other types of things that are, you know, not herbaceous. Um, so Occasionally a beaver is eaten by an otter, but it's very, very uncommon is what Mary Holland says. Um, but the otter, on the other hand, benefits from abandoned and active lodge sites so that they can, they'll live inside with the beavers sometimes. Um, and she's found scat of otters outside of the beaver lodge with a beaver print right next to it. So I think that they are maybe fair weather friends, <laughs> it sounds like. That sounds like a children's book in the making. Yeah. Oh, and then my dad, hi dad, um, says he read something about the Audubon Christmas bird count done annually. What trends have we seen in recent years in terms of diversity and population? Ray, do you happen to know this? I do not happen to know this, like the data that comes out from that. Um, I was going to do some sleuthing. I don't happen to know this off the top of my head, but we can definitely get you a link that has a report about those trends, or maybe Ray will read something and share with us in a few minutes. Yeah. Right. You're right about Audubon, the Christmas bird count being a very long standing um, community science project. I think this is the 121st year that the yeah. Christmas bird count is happening, which makes it the longest community science project 
in the country. And it, it was started because people used to go out on Christmas Day and shoot birds. And then they would kind of tally up how many birds they shot and whoever won had the most dead birds. And I think it was Frank Chapman. We're talking about today, Allison, is that the name? And um, he said, let's start looking for birds instead and documenting them as opposed to shooting them. And so that's what started it. And they're now, they're Christmas bird circles all over um, the United States. And if you want to participate, um, you can Google, I think on, I think on Vermont eBird, there's a link. You could probably contact either Sarah or Ray. Uh, but there are circles almost everywhere, and it's going to look very different this year. Usually it's groups of people going out together. I think this year everybody's going to be on their own or with their own family group. But there's still always, you know, an, there's always a need for people going out. And even if you don't want to go out, even if you just keep track of the birds at your feeder within the count, within on the day of the count, that can be really helpful. So it looks like there's this um, Christmas bird count tracker. And so you can see how um, each bird is compares and is doing. Um, and you can look by your state, you can look by um, a bir different bird species, and you can look at like countrywide trends and things like that, which is kind of cool. Um, and you can do it, they have these time periods, which is really awesome. Um, and it's all through GIS, it looks like, which is really cool. So there are lots of trends to be looked at with this trend tracker. If you're also also interested in looking at bird trends, we have a really cool climate tool with on our national website that shows us how affected different bird species will be affected by climate change. And there are target species that have been identified that we're working harder to gather information about or protect because they've been identified as in critical um, condition or like we need to start doing something before they vanish. So if you would like to check that out too, we can drop that in the link as well. And it kind of the idea of birds needing, maybe needing help or having threats to them. Um, William asked about cats. He said in Florida, there's a large indoor outdoor domestic cat population, which devastates local bird populations. And cats are, I think the number is like cats kill 60 million songbirds a year. And one thing about cats is they may not kill it. You may think your bird, your cat isn't killing a bird, but if they just bite the bird, the bird could later die of sepsis. So just even any, any damage from a cat can be devastating to a bird. And then he asked the question, is this a problem in Vermont? And if so, what are some solutions? And that's kind of tough. I, I feel free if anyone has another answer, jump in, but I don't think it's as big of a problem here because I don't think there is many feral house cats. I mean, there might be some around farms and people might let their cats outside, but because of the, you know, because of the winter, I don't think there's as big of a population. But what do you guys think? I'd be curious in Burlington what the issue is because there are so many stray cats here. Uh, it's a constant point of contention in the Burlington community. Um, and I know that there's actually a local Vermont maker who makes those um, kind of looks like a clown outfit, but it's a necklace that has bells and like extra fabric so that they alert the birds when they're coming. Um, but I'm not sure, but I'm sure some bird casualties happen every day here. I think um, we hear mostly at the museum that um, it's the springtime when there are birds busy nesting and their young ones that may not be um, ready to fledge but fall out of the nest and cats cats know that they're on the lookout and uh, that doesn't mean that um, you know that they suddenly turn feral <laughs> when they're normally an indoor cat or, or a, a cat that stays close to home but that's what cats do, certainly. They are um, carnivores and stealthy hunters. So uh, springtime seems to be when they're the most vulnerable. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of a problem everywhere, considering the fact that they kill 2.4 billion bird songbirds a year, which is just like when we're in the B, not the, the M, that's pretty crazy. Um, and I definitely, from my experience, all the cats that I know in my life have killed <laughs> birds in Vermont. Not that that's data, but I feel like it's still an issue, but we're combating it with those collars. 
if they don't lose them. <laughs> yeah, the bird be safe is uh, the, the website is in the chat. And the theory is, and she's actually done some studies about it, but the theory is that um, it's a bright, colorful necklace or, and, and that the birds are more sensitive to bright color and movement than they are to a dingling bell. So bells don't, don't really work. I mean, obviously the best thing is if everybody keeps their cat inside, but it, it is, it's definitely a point of contention when you ask cat owners to keep their cats inside. Yeah, the, the, the birds be safe actually looks like a, a clown's collar. I mean, it is that bright and it is made out of cloth. So it doesn't harm the cat at all, um, but it is a very visual um, object that birds are going to notice right away because it's something that's not normally in their environment. Um, so cats um, may, as Ray just mentioned, they may figure out how to take them off, but I haven't heard that yet. Great, thanks for that question, William. Um, let's look at our list here. Um, so there's, there is another question in the chat. Sure. Uh, it says, how healthy is the eagle population in Vermont? On Long Island, New York, they've been seen breeding in very recent years. And this summer for the first time on the North Folk is seen firsthand and photographed by Sarah. Nice job. Thank you. <laughs> So the, um, the bald eagle is a success story in Vermont, and it's currently on the state endangered list, but it's about to come off that because they've um, been tracking the population and the population goals have been met for the last five years. So at this point, the eagle population is doing quite well, and it's, it's still really exciting to see eagles because they had been state endangered, but they, um, they're doing quite well right now. Oh, thank you. And Ray put in the chat um, some interest, some websites about specifics about the delisting and about the eagle recovery. Yeah, that first um, one is the most recent article about them delisting, and the second one is just the overall trends, basically, of eagles in Vermont, which they definitely are on the upswing. And if you live in Vermont, we're going to start doing our eagle surveying soon. And if you're interested in doing that, you should email Margaret, which I can put her email on the list. Um, but essentially, it's just um, there's a period of time where you go out and search to see if you see eagles along different waterways because right now it's kind of easy to see them because one they are actually nesting and breeding um, and so they're sort of localized and they're hunting along the rivers but as well this year it's not that cold right now but as the rivers ice up there's their hunting grounds are so limited that if you find open water you're pretty guaranteed to see an eagle or these this time of year um, I saw one last weekend which is kind of exciting but Basically, we're just counting and um, looking at all of the nesting pairs and the eagles around. Um, so it's a pretty cool survey and it's definitely worth being a part of. And it might not be a thing in the future because the eagles are doing so well. So <laughs> if you live in Vermont, you should do it this year. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So Sarah, I got a text um, with a question kind of relating to, is that going back to the mammals, to the beavers and the otters. And it was about it was about muskrat, and so I don't know if you have a picture of a muskrat. Um, and it was a little bit about what do they do in the winter, and and what do we look for. So I don't know if you could pull up a picture of a muskrat lodge. Yeah, I can pull one up. That would be great. So muskrats are are awake all winter, and they um they have some really interesting adaptations for survival. In the fall, they put together these really it's piles of vegetation, and it's kind of pushed together with, held together with the muck from the bottom of the pond. And then they, they eat into it and they kind of eat into it and create their own, their living spaces. And they can only access these by, oh, that's really cool. Um, <laughs> they get bigger. <laughs> they can only access them through the underwater. So they can go underwater and then kind of come up to where they live for safety. Um, but they have to eat all year so they will they'll come out of these their lodges where they're staying and they'll go eat and they create these little things called a push-up which actually looks like a little um almost like a little lodge where they they push up through the ice so they have air holes and they fill that little hole of the push-up with other cattails and vegetations and they keep going up through there and that means that they need to swim like all the way across the pond they can stop part way through 
and um, take a breath of air and have a bite to eat and then continue on to wherever they're going. There's some pretty great pictures. So yeah. I think that it's nice showing that lodge and it is, it looks like kind of a pile of, of um, cattails. Yeah, I've been in an area where there have been a bunch of muskrats and so it almost looks like it's a natural phenomenon. You don't realize that a creature is actually living in those little mounds. It just looks like the earth is just mounding up in that way and the cattails are piling that way. But it's just all, the, you can tell usually because there's um, paths through the debris. That's a giveaway, the trails. And in this photo, you can see its tail, which I feel like sometimes people ask me, how do you tell the difference between a muskrat and a beaver? I think beavers are just massive <laughs> in comparison to Much a muskrat. Bigger. Um, but definitely the tail, the muskrat has more of like the rodent like tail that's smooth and long and skinny, whereas the beaver has that big, big paddle on the back of its body. Yeah. Here they are. <laughs> it's hard to tell from the front and size wise yeah. is huge if you don't know them. Do you have any other favorite mammals that have cool winter adaptations, naturalists? Well, I noticed that somebody put in here the snowshoe hare, which maybe that's a I question. I did do for, that. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's a question for later, but I think that that is pretty cool. So, um, first of all, snowshoe hares with their name, they're called that because they basically, their back feet um, have, they're huge. They are basically snowshoes. And so, Snowshoe hares live up um, at higher elevations and they live in really, really tight, tight trees to keep themselves safe. And you can see there's two pictures here and one of the hares is white and one of them is brown. And so they change their, their coat color as the winter comes. And it's really um, alarming like with climate change. Sometimes um, it's not like they see the snow and they're like, ooh, and like push really hard to change the color of their hair. It's a pattern that's been ingrained in them for since the beginning of them. And so they, um, some of them are like white in these uh, really bright places. And so it's kind of interesting to watch them as climate change is changing, the snow pattern changes um, because sometimes they're stuck white or stuck brown. Um, and then they stand out quite a bit. If you're brown on a white surface or if you're white on a brown surface, you, that is the opposite of what you want, but they blend in so well otherwise. Um, and it's pretty amazing that they change and they're very, very cool. Um, and they're really, really fast. And ermine and long-tailed weasels do this too. Yeah, totally. But they don't have the built-in snowshoes, unfortunately. <laughs> they climb trees. Yeah. Yeah. Allison, do you want to speak to the ruffed grouse at all again? I loved some of your facts. Oh, let me pull the ruffed grouse. Well, speaking of snowshoes, yeah, that's probably the standout adaptation that ruffed grouse um, have adapted yeah. Oh, yeah. to use in the winter. This is a, a bird that's also known as a partridge. It um, looks like a chicken, not quite that big, but it lives in the more, yes, the understory. You can see the beautiful patterning of the the different browns and, and bronzes and copper colored feathers and black feathers. Um, they're just really quite handsome to look at. Um, but they habitat, their habitat favorite is um, more the understory um, with low conifers around and a, a bit of a stream bed nearby. They eat um, vegetation around the streams. Um, and then in the winter time, they eat buds on plants, especially birches and aspens, big tooth aspens, which we have plenty of. So they thrive very well in the winter as long as they can survive the conditions. They're not great flyers. Um, they take a while to get off, um, or they can't fly for long, but they can, they can uh, quickly move. So you might flush one out um, of a woodland area as you're walking through. In the uh, winter time, with all the snow, um, Ray just showed that picture of their foot. And if you look at the, uh, the, the three toes there, you can see all these little comb-like structures that have formed around the toes. They're called pectinations. And they grow in the fall 
and actually end up widening the width of each of those toes. So they do serve a little bit of the same function as snowshoes. And these birds can walk along the surface of the snow. Um, and that really helps them move around a lot more um, quickly and efficiently without wasting a lot of energy. Those pectinations do just fall off again in the spring. Um, so it really is not a, a um, traumatic event for the birds, um, but it's a very big help for the birds. Uh, another thing that's really interesting that they do because they can't fly very far and, and get too far away from predators when they are perched on a typically a conifer branch and there's been a deep snow at least 10 inches deep these birds will dive directly into the snow head first they will um, be deep enough so that there's a nice snow shelf above them and they will tunnel about oh three feet maybe up to three feet under the snow to build a little snow cave under the ground and then they stay there um, throughout a particular storm or, or for a little while till um, it's uh, appropriate to come back out again. But they um, manage very well in this kind of condition. And then when something either flushes them again because the vibrations and the sound of someone moving nearby um, might send them into um, a uh, mode where they have to get out quickly, they will just they will just burst out like an eruption coming out of the snow and then they'll quickly uh, move to a nearby tree um, flying very fast but very short distances and there's a picture of what looks like an exit hole you can see right there at about um, eight o'clock on that picture lower left um, there is a hole but look at the the wing uh, pattern on top of the snow so i'm not sure whether that's it looks like an it might even be an entrance, I guess, but usually they just dive in so quickly. I don't know whether they came out, maybe a predator came and helped yank them out, but it looks like it looks like a lot of wing patterning there um, and tail in the far end. So interesting story to create out of that. Uh, but those are two really significant adaptations that these birds manage to deal with the winter uh, weather. One thing that, that always concerns me and those of you that walk on crusty, icy snow um, over a nice um, soft snowfall, I just don't quite know how much power they have to have to get out. You know, after a little while, um, as the snow cover gets harder, it's probably a bit of a struggle. So there's likely a guarantee that some of these birds don't come out um, in time to survive. I don't know what statistics are like on that at all. That's and I don't know that any other bird does that. So this just makes it that much more remarkable. Allison told me once, if you're having a hard time picturing the rough grouse going into the snow, to take a delicata squash and throw it into the snow and how it kind of poofs down, goes in and the snow kind of poofs over it as it goes in. That's kind of what the rough grouse does. That's an awesome analogy. <laughs> I have to say, which maybe this is a testament to the effects of backcountry skiing, but I have been on very quiet days, backcountry or cross-country skiing, and have come so close to where they are that they come flying out and been scared multiple times, which has been <laughs> pretty wild. But yeah, they come flying out of there and their wings are so loud that it sounds like a helicopter. Um, but yeah, it's definitely intense. It takes a lot of power for them to get going. And um, Bert Heinrich, who's, who's written a lot of um, nature-related books, he had an article in about winter, birds in the winter, and he was talking about rough grouse, and they, they poop while they're in the hole that Allison was talking about. And he has in the article, I don't know if he calculated this, but they make 3.7 fecal pellets per hour. So if they come flying out of the hole, you can look down and count how many fecal pellets there are, and then you can figure out how many hours they were in that hole. That is really cool. It's <laughs> really cool. Oh, I haven't checked the chat. 
Ray, why don't you pull up the slide that has which the group of birds that yeah. are going to stay during winter? That might be a good one to start looking at so folks can familiarize themselves with those birds. Um, I know that during the winter, I started birding maybe about two years ago, and the winter time was a great time for me to start because there aren't as many birds around, and I was able to watch my feeder and play songs that I could try to practice before springtime because they're not calling as often in the winter either. They're not looking for mates or trying to impress anybody. Um, but you'll still hear woodpeckers squeaking and nuthatches making their little laughing noises. But um, I, I just found it very helpful to start in the winter. And then as the spring migrants come, like kind of digesting them as they come to and just building up on your bird repertoire. Um, but we have the downy woodpecker up in the left hand corner. They are the smallest woodpecker in Vermont, yeah? Yeah. Um, and they look very similar to hairy woodpeckers. Hairy woodpeckers are bigger and they have bigger beaks as well. Um, then we have chickadee, of course. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the black-capped chickadee. They're one of my favorite birds simply because they're so persistent and they stay all year. And Cardinal, that's a male cardinal. You'll find male birds are always more flashy than the females because they're trying to show off. Um, and then we have a goldfinch who's kind of molted and lost some of that neon yellow color. It's kind of a um, like creamy color in the bottom left corner. A tufted titmouse. And then, oh, I did include a picture of the hairy woodpecker. So you can kind of see even in those small photos that the hairy woodpecker's beak is a little bit longer and that it is a bit bigger of a bird. And Ray, just um, quickly, we we also see um, red-bellied woodpeckers at at the uh, feeders. Um, some of you may be lucky enough to have those come by. Affiliated woodpeckers are out there, but not so much feeder birds unless they're coming for suet. The one woodpecker that we have in the area through breeding season, um, the flicker, the uh, yellow-shafted flicker here in Vermont, is the only one that migrates. Um, and if you know what it eats, you'll understand why. Even though they look and act like woodpeckers, they nest in um, cavity holes. The uh, woodpecker, the yellow shafted woodpecker lives or walks around on the ground, um, probing in the ground for ants. That's its main food source. So of course they can't do well here in the snowy cold winters. And they're the ones that go. The other, we're so privileged in Vermont with two cool yellow woodpeckers is we also have a woodpecker that again behaves a little differently the yellow-bellied sap sucker um, so by its name they are drinking sap so have you ever walked around and you've seen a tree which i could pull up a picture in a minute um, it's got perfect holes it looks like someone took a ruler and every like couple of centimeters drilled a hole um, that's the sap sucker drilling for sap to get the sap to flow and then they drink the sap and so in the winter time trees aren't producing their sap, it's not flowing because the trees go dormant, they go to sleep and their sap is mostly water, so it freezes. Um, and so the sap suckers also don't stick around, but it's kind of cool that here they're both yellow something and they, <laughs> they both leave. Um, and I like the picture of the goldfinch, speaking of yellow, is they, they have their, their winter molt and they look quite drab and they don't have that bright yellow, but the males start getting just little patches of bright yellow, even in February. So we might be in the middle of a nor'easter and you look out at your bird feeder and the goldfinch has just like a little patch of yellow and it doesn't feel like spring is ever gonna come, but that goldfinch knows and is getting ready because spring will be coming. Do you think it's been long enough and we're ready to talk about poop, some scat? Cause I would love to, an opportunity, great. <laughs> so another cool winter adaptation is um, so some animals, they, I'm not sure if you already talked about this, I'm sure you already did, but some animals leave, like in order to adapt to winter, um, winter is really hard. We all know because we bundle up and we drink hot chocolate and we prepare for winter. There's so many things that we do, but animals need to survive. They need their food, their water, their shelter, and their space, right? And so some animals cannot survive in the space because they can't find food. It's usually the main thing. Um, so they have to leave. Um, and so some animals, they are just like, I don't feel, I can't, I can't go travel far like snakes. They can't go so far. Um, so they, some animals hibernate, they stick around, but they find a safe place to keep warm all winter. 
And then some animals do like something that is sort of in between, it's called torpor. Um, so they're dormant, but on really nice days, they'll come out and they'll get some food. So you'll notice on really nice days um, that aren't too cold, chipmunks are out and about and um, raccoons and things like that. Um, but as it, those really cold days, you don't see their tracks as much. Um, and then some of them migrate and then some of them are active. Um, but the animals that are sticking around in winter, they are um, the animals that are herbivores. They're completely changing their diet, right? So the best bang for your buck for food is um, fruit. You could go to a tree and eat fruit that is like high in all the things that you need. It will fill you right up. Um, but they, that's not around in winter. And also those leaves, the, eating the chlorophyll, that's so helpful. But so animals um, sort of change their diets. So they're going from like porcupines and white-tailed deer, moose, and then rabbits. Um, they are going to eat barks, twigs, buds, and shrubs. So they're going from this really delicious, like nice diet to this really rough and grainy and fibrous diet. And so deer, for example, completely changed their way that their stomach is. Um, so they, their, their whole like micro, microorganism system changes and it's really, really cool, but you'll notice um, in the springtime, deer will obviously be really excited to eat those leaves and they'll eat those leaves, but they'll get a tummy ache and you'll notice that their scat, it's more loose than tight and it takes a while for their, their poop to become those pellets again, like the classic deer scat is those perfect little pellets that you see all the time, but you'll notice it'll be like clumpy or it'll be watery, it'll be like one big like cow pie. And so their stomach is getting used to and changing back over completely to um, eat those, those fruits and those greens. But I think that's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. It's pretty amazing that they can change their entire physiology. And, um, and it does bring up that a lot of times people worry about deer or animals and they wonder if they should feed them. And it, it's actually not helpful to feed a deer straw or hay or something that they're not eating at this time because they can actually still starve to death with a full stomach. And so it, it, there are lots of really great ways to help wildlife, but sometimes directly feeding them isn't really the best way. One of the great ways is, um, and Ray sort of alluded to this, is just planting things that they will eat. So planting native in your gardens or your backyard, remove invasives and put filling it in with native plants can actually help pretty much most of the animals that we talked about tonight. Maybe not the muskrat. And, and there's a great website. Audubon did this awesome thing. It's called Plants for Birds. Uh, sorry, Sarah, we think the same thing. Um, but this is such a cool resource. Um, my experience using it, I'm going to put a disclaimer. Um, it's not Basic, so basically you go to this resource, it's called Plant for Birds, you put your email in. So as you start to make a list, it emails it to you at the end, you put your zip code in. And so it's native species that are obviously native to your area because a native species to Vermont um, isn't necessarily a native species somewhere else. Um, but in, so it really narrows it down. But at the same time, like if you live in the Northeast Kingdom compared to Southern Vermont, it's not that specific, it's just Vermont. So it's Vermont. So some species, you should definitely do your research and make sure you have the habitat for your species. Um, or you can call us and we can help you out. Um, but it's a really cool resource. Um, and you can, the way that it works is you can go to it and choose a bird if you're like, oh, I really just want indigo buntings in my backyard it's so bad. Um, and you can pick your bird and then it'll tell you what plants indigo buntings like. So that is a great resource. It's also but, a really great um, planting native because a number of us live in the in rural areas and so we can't have bird feeders up all year round because of bear or other other things we don't want to attract and by planting a lot of native species you actually end up getting a lot of birds that way. Yeah people call all the time at Audubon and they're always asking, they always ask that question. They're like, I really want to keep my bird feeder out, but I can't because the bear keeps taking it down. What do I do? And I'm like, well, in, in the springtime, you can plant a bunch of plants. It's really expensive in the beginning, but worth it in the long run. The other thing is to add a water feature. You know, yeah. adding, adding water can be very important for the birds. Also, Are there any other burning questions in the last couple minutes that anybody wants to add? There's so many more things that we could cover, but. Is 
If there's anything that you think of after this call, I know that at Audubon Vermont, we field lots of um, inquiries about what people are seeing in their backyard or how they get a bird out of their house or anything in between. And Erin, do you get calls like that as well? At we do get lots of calls and we certainly welcome them. So go ahead, give us a call if you have a pressing question that we didn't get to today or if something comes up. But um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're just about at the end of the time here. And uh, this event was free. So I'm just gonna plug in some of our websites where you can donate to us if you liked the content. And we're gonna hope to do some more of these in the future. And I wrote this in the chat, but I will send out an email to everybody who participated with all of these links since I know we threw a lot of information at you. I wanna make sure that you retain. Great, have a great night, everybody. I have one other quick question. If we do yeah. another Ask a Naturalist, if you have a topic, so this is a pretty big topic, winter in Vermont, and we could certainly focus in or keep it really general. We'd love to have some feedback of what, what kind of topic people wanna know about. Thank you. Great, thanks everybody, have a great night. Thanks.